hit left and right, a real trial. Greatest leadership challenge I ever had in my life was trying to keep this troop of Boy Scouts out there on the beach, even in their tents, when we were surrounded by mosquitoes as we were. I remember I went off to 7-Elevens, and in one place I got the last can, the last can of spray to kill mosquitoes. So I went to each tent door, and only three of those boys died that night from what I sprayed into those tents. <laughs> You're not listening a bit, are you? Wait, wait, wait. Only three! And they were the lowest, no, no evil scouts among them, no sir. Anyways, it's the little things, the little things, hitting and nipping, nip, hitting and nipping. I have a friend, by the way, who's retiring. We're not going to be in the city on the Sunday, we're going to, uh, on Saturday, we're going to go out on the island and be part of a man's retiring. What a good man, what a good man. A few years ago, he fell from the roof of his house, though, doing some repairs, and he's not been the same since. And after 29 years of serving God in that one church, he's retired, and we're going to go out and be part of that celebration and his joy and uh, honor him. I think what our friend, what our friend has gone through in 29 years, you know, just to live is to do some suffering, to feel some pain. Gone are the days, I think they're virtually all but two in this room right now. Gone are the days where we have really this really great feeling as we used to have as, a, as kids, how good it is to get up in the morning, how good it is to stretch, how powerful and how wonderful you feel to be able to run with vigor of all your heart. Now as Pastor Rose can barely hobble around, he remembers the days when he would rather have run than walk. Things change. We're going to face even more challenges and obstacles, big and small. How will we face them and by whose power will we get through? Well, I want to suggest Paul's God, because Paul's God is our God. And Paul's God saw him through. First, let me say this. I don't want to make a big deal about Paul to the exclusion of Jesus. Sometimes we have a tendency to do that. But I remember in my Bible, don't you, about Jesus? The Bible says that he is the one who was despised and rejected of men. The Bible says he is the man of sorrows. Whatever Paul went through was not as bad as what Jesus went through for us. You know, he was, the Bible says, acquainted with grief. He was acquainted with grief. He bore our sorrows, our griefs, and carried our sorrows. This one, and so we should never let Paul come close to obscuring our vision of Jesus. For he was smitten of God for us and afflicted. But remember, Paul becomes a believer. Maybe it was his nature, but he was not content to be just any believer. He had ambitions and desires. Again, I think an entrepreneur for the Lord. If you know recent church history, the closest one I can think of would maybe be a man like Dwight Moody of the late 1800s, who was a firebrand for God in both Europe and America. The 18th, uh, 1800s equivalent, in many ways, of Billy Graham, some would say, in a day without the, all the technology that we have today. Fighting, feisty, advancing, selling, resting. Maybe that's why he went to prison. God was insisting, you need to rest. Because he was so active toward his Lord. He learned during that time, he spent some time in obscurity, testing his faithfulness to God in a way by could he be a Christian and be faithful and flourish out of the limelight? Could he sit out a few games or a few innings of a game, a game of life, to be advanced in the things of the Spirit? And Paul learned. Some of us don't learn easy. I've tried twice or three times at least, perhaps in my life, at college and in high school, uh, even here in the city once during the years here, trying to learn Spanish. I am not, I've, I've had an easier time with Greek, I think, than I did with Spanish. And uh, Hebrew, uh, <coughs> marginal. But Spanish, I experienced it, and uh, I can, I know a few hundred vocabulary words, that's about it. I know CC and Por favor, and uh, 
arroz. And I go, gelato? And I can't eat it anymore. I, I know gelato. And uh, words like that, you go. Know. <laughs> You're surprised and amazed, aren't you, brother? You know, I, I, I also took piano a couple of times. These delicate digits here have graced with likeness the keyboards of several embarrassed instruments over the years. At least a couple of times, I remember it with such embarrassment. That was back, of course, uh, when Joanna began to play her piano. Joanna's really great today. But, uh, you know, when, when the daughter can do so much better than dad, I, I think I dropped out. I, I was embarrassed and I quit. Anyways, I'm slow. Mr. Rose? Yes, that's middle C. It's in the same spot I showed it where it was last week, Mr. Rose. <laughs> Will you remember next week, Mr. Rose? What key is that? What, what note is that right there? Middle, middle, middle C. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we get things slow. That's why, by the way, that the strength that we need to have in a time of crisis needs to be ours before the crisis. That strength will not just mysteriously, miraculously appear when we have not prepared for it. As with most things in life, what we prepare for is what we'll have. If I'm an athlete and I'm trying to get ready for the opening of the, of the Major League Baseball season, it doesn't come just before, because I decide today I'm going to be a Major Leaguer. It comes over long years of stretching and exercising, of rehearsing again and again, repeating and practice all sorts of moves essential to the position that I want. All sorts of preparation, and so also in our spiritual lives, there's necessity of preparation, advancement, growth, that I might be what I might be in my God. And I appreciate the thought of my friends today that there's some commitment, there's some intentionality that's involved in that. And I share another verse. Let me share with you this wonderful verse, many of you do know it, of course. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Paul is the man writing, inspired by God. He uses in the first line the word beseech. You probably have never used that word in your house to any other member of your family, but he is begging. This is Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. He says, I beseech you, I beg you, I'll do whatever it takes to convince you that you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I think that last part means, in part, it's what you owe Him. Please know that as Paul writes this, he's already gone through this himself. He was no hypocrite. He was encouraging these to give their bodies to Christ. And uh, no doubt he had decided that, the same for his own life. I know you're tending to think, well, that doesn't sound very spiritual. We're talking about bodies? Yes. You know, that we are not platonic types. We're not, we're not of that suasion so popular in some circles. A few of those circles even moving still today, but from antiquity especially, that despise the body. A Christian has a care about the body because we still have our bodies and we're going to be stewards of them. We are responsible for our body, and frankly, as believers now, how are we going to live out our sanctification or our separateness unto God? By our bodies. We need to offer unto God our bodies, I beg you, says Paul. I beg you, this is such a primary thing. I beseech you, because of all that is before in my life, in Romans, it's quite a lengthy letter, uh, chapter 12 and verse 1, give it to God, give it to God. Some of us are tempted right now to sin. We have things in our minds and heart and are just within reach of our hands, and, and we want, do we want to be pure? Do we want to take a stance against sin? Paul would tell us in this crisis, in this time, today, right now, maybe you're not pressured at all, but right now, get it settled once and for all. Who is Lord? Who is Lord? And Lord of your body. I'm going to share with you the verse.
first sign, signed in my yearbook when I graduated from Bible school. I'm not sure I've ever done this before. It's in the book of Colossians. In the book of Colossians. Now I know many of you have remembered that my life's verse is actually Matthew 4.4. 4. That's true. Matthew 4.4 4 is a great verse. It says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's a quotation from Deuteronomy 8.3. A great verse. It's my life's verse. But for some reason, back in probably 1970, and the yearbook, I put down as the verse I wanted in my yearbook, Colossians 3.3. 3. It says, For ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's quite an interesting verse. That's what we're really, you know, pack a good sandwich or two to go off to the park and sit on a bench alone and think about it. We're dead. Any life we have, by the way, we've already seen in the book of Ephesians, we have been so dead we need to be quickened. We need to, by the power of God, be yanked out of that deadness. But really, we are nothing. We're not giving really much up unto God when we do give up our lives. The only way to have success in Him is to give up our bodies to Him and acknowledge them as dead. I think Paul was of that persuasion. And so when he ended up being brutalized in his punishment, there were not usually mediators to hold the whip from landing another time or two. Paul went through severe torture, nothing that we have ever experienced in that nature in anybody in this room. 39 lashes of the whip several times. Any one of those lashes, severe pain, cutting the body, he suffered for the Lord. When I came to prison, I can't think of probably anything such a mind and heart would have disdained more than being bored. Prison can be very boring. I think about the two years or so that he spent in Caesarea. Of course, before that, there's the famous scene where on one of his missionary journeys in Philippi, he, with Silas, is in jail. Remember the earthquake? We're thinking a little bit about earthquakes recently, aren't we? And earthquakes struck, and all the prisoners were gone, of course. No, they weren't. The jailer himself was surprised. He almost took his own life because he knew torture would have been horrible if anybody had escaped. Paul and Silas reassured, we're all here, don't take your life. And this man came in and humbled himself before the gospel and became a believer. The Bible says all his house believed with him. Now what if Paul and Silas had not been in that prison? Prison. What about what we face in our own lives? Could there be things that we have already faced or are facing or will face that actually have a good facet to them? A perspective of them that is helpful and good or does good in others? Maybe at our cost, some of them. Paul actually experienced this. But now, as he's nearing the end of his life, even, he's not going to be allowed to even, we know, lead to get out of this life and this experience outside of a jail. He is in 2 Timothy. In the last moments of his life, he's penning, or having someone else pen in his dictation, this from God, advice to young Timothy, the last words from his pen in his mouth. He's using even the hours in prison. Nothing's going to deter him from serving his God. Why is that? Romans 12, 1, he has presented his body unto God. And God has used his body. We need to present our bodies unto God. You know, if he is our Lord, and he is in charge, then frankly, all is well. We've talked in years past here frequently about what if, as happens throughout such a group all the time, somebody here got AIDS, or someone here found themselves with pancreatic cancer, some other kind of cancer so severe and like quick to take a life. What happens in a Christian? The Lord has not promised, by the way, any of us that we will not experience those things. Those very things are things 
that have been often used from that drawer of curriculum by the greatest teacher the world has ever known, the universe has ever known, he has often used such trials to draw us and others to himself, more closely to himself. Why, my God, think about this, he actually looks at some of those things as in really being good for us.
but all is so all-inclusive. How can it be fitting and appropriate that the word all, when we think of seven billion people in this world, how is it possible that God, it's because he is supreme, and we would accept this this morning, he is almighty. I know there are little, little rivulets of questions about that, and we like sometimes to think there are certain areas where he is not 100% totally in charge. I want to suggest to you this morning, don't see me about this, and let me persuade you, if I can, to the logicalness of the thought that if he is not supreme, supremely God in everything, then he can't possibly really be fully supreme in anything. Think about it. How can he be supreme over all if somehow there is some area, some piece of the pie where he has no control, where it's not under his control, why if things have any interreaction at all, then there's all sorts of little rivulets of defiance and fallibility. I look at it and the, the supreme joy and reassurance of living is this reassurance that he is in charge. Hence, you look at verse 28. And yes, that means even the bad things that happen to me. There's a God who's involved, always involved. Verse 28, we know that all things work together for good. Now some would say, always for good? You're kidding me. For always for good. I don't know every case. I don't know every tragic story. And there are many. I know my own stories. I know my own experiences. I would certainly like to have missed some of these stories, some of these experiences. But when the Bible says that indeed, full knowledge, full truth, and these words come from God, not really from Paul, when those are applied, evaluation comes out, the computer ejects a little card that says all things, all things, for good. And so, what do we pray for? We pray, God wants to hear us approach him, expressing our own sincerity, a little bit of coming communication regarding these things, and perhaps the bearing of our heart, and our coming and expressing before him our hopelessness, our helplessness, apart from him.